Okay, so let's start. So, Michael, first of all, uh, thank you very much for this interview. Uh, thanks for spending your time with us. And also, thanks indeed for all the work you have been doing through your blog. And I'm going to give the address of the blog, the next recession.wordpress.com, right? Yeah. Uh, it's really amazing the amount of writing you do about the economic foundations of capitalism and how it's going right now and the data you offer and the empirical evidences you offer us. It's really a great contribution to the Marxist and socialist discussion because it is deep, it is full of data and analysis, but at the same time is accessible to people, uh, people like me, for example, who is not an expert in economics, but is engaged in the struggle to defeat capitalism. And you give us some important weapons for that. Everything you write helps us a lot in the debate, uh, including the debate within the left, right? Because uh, you help us fight illusions that it's possible to humanize capitalism and that uh, reform and not revolution is the way to change the horrible situation of the majority of the people. When you explain the contradictions of capitalism, you make our struggle to build a revolutionary alternative stronger. So thank you very much. <laughs> Well, thank you, Luciana, for inviting me and the PSL of MES, because um, having read up about you, I'm really honoured to be there because you're doing a fantastic job uh, in trying to bring together the, the militant workers in Brazil and socialists together to try and provide an alternative to the people of Brazil. It's a tough task that you face, as we do everywhere, and it's just amazing how well you've managed to do this over the last couple, two, two decades or so. Uh, to do that. And I'm really pleased to be able to have this interview with you and contribute to this um, discussion. Thank you very much. It's a collective work we do here and uh, it's, it's, very, it's very hard, but uh, we are putting forward. We are going, going ahead. Well, so uh, let me start reading the presentation your blog makes of yourself for those who doesn't know it yet. Uh, Michael Roberts worked in the city of London as an economist for over 40 years. He has closely observed the machinations of global capitalism from within the dragon's den. <laughs> At the same time, he was a political activist in the labor movement for decades. Since retiring, he has written several books. The Great Recession, A Marxist View, The Long Depression, Marx 200, A Review of Marx Economics, and jointly with Guglielmo Carcetti as editors of World in Crisis. He has published numerous papers in various academic journals and articles in left publications. And I say once a week, more or less, I believe, there's a new article in his blog. Do you, do you write once a week regularly or do you have more flexible uh, time, uh, Michael? It, it's reasonably flexible, Luciana. I, I, I write if I find something I want to say or I think uh, the reader should know. So sometimes it could be more than once a week or sometimes a little less. But on average, I don't know uh, uh, exactly how many posts in the blog I did in 2021. Uh, I think it was slightly less than 2020, but... Um, more people read them, so maybe that's good enough. Yeah, <laughs> but quite a lot of posts. Uh, and, but lot. That's, that's possible because um, I'm an old man, Luciana, and, and I don't have to do anything anymore. You guys have to work, make a living, put things <laughs> together. I just sit in, in front of the computer and tap away thinking. So it's easier to write a lot more. Oh, it's easy for you because <laughs> it's not easy for other people to write as, as well as you write. Well, and the Dragon's Den, uh, what, yeah. what does it mean when you say that you work at the Dragon's Den? Tell us a little bit about this. This is, um, well, I think the um, allusion is to um, a British TV program where the, 
they have three capitalists who interview people about whether they've got a good project that can make money in a capitalist company. It's a competition on the TV. Can you imagine? You have a competition to see if you could be the best capitalist. And the, the three capitalists interview potential capitalists to see how successful their project might be. And they call this program the Dragon's Den. Uh, wow. the, presumably that the capitalist, capitalism is a sort of den of dragons and uh, some of them have fire and some of them don't. Uh, the person who wrote that particular uh, description of my activities was not me. It was somebody who insisted on wanting to put my website up for me for nothing. So he wrote this little piece. I don't know if I would use that <laughs> phrase, but that's what it means. <laughs> okay, very good. So I mean, I've been working in, in the Dragons. I've been working in the city, in the financial institutions, as, as an economist, in banks, uh, uh, working for companies that, or for institutions which advise big uh, institutions about whether they should buy the real or sell the real, whether they should uh, take advantage of the Mexican peso going down. Uh, in other words, very nasty decisions that they're making to make, but all the purpose is to make money, of course. Uh, it makes you uh, a, a, a rare person because uh, we have uh, some professors that yeah. uh, are uh, Marxist economists, but yeah. uh, I don't know any other man that came from uh, the market, let's say like that, and is a, a there, there are very few, very few. As you say, most Marxist economics professors are professors. They, yeah. If they manage to get a job in a university in Brazil or anywhere else, which is very difficult for a Marxist economist, very few get jobs, but that, that's where Marxist economics dominates in the ac academic world. But exactly. there are a few of us who have never been in the academic world, who have been professional economists. Uh, and um, I can name a few if you're interested, but they're mainly in the north of northern Europe. And one or two of us have been able to work in, in financial institutions and then also do Marxist economic work. In my opinion, Luciania, I think that gives us an advantage uh, over the academic that we we can see the machinations of uh, finance capital uh, on a daily basis and understand its nature, perhaps more than the academic professors. I have to be careful here because most of these Marxist academic professors are my friends, so I don't sure. want to be too critical <laughs> of that. But I think I, get, I have a bit of an advantage uh, uh, as a result. For sure, the, the machinations, to see the machinations from inside is, yeah. is, is a privilege. Sure. As long as you don't become part of the machinations. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> well, let's start talking about your view of the present situation of uh, mm. capitalism. You, you say that uh, at the moment uh, we are in a depression that is something different from the recurrent ups and downs of the capitalism the cycles of boom and slump or recessions that occur every eight or 10 years. In your view, this is the third depression of the capitalism, it's something different from these recessions. The first depression was in 1870 to 1890, right? The second right. and famous one. Uh, the third, the, the 1930s, long depression that went till the beginning of the Second World War. And now we are in the middle of the third. So can you explain to our viewers the difference between these recurring recessions and these depressions and the cause of this depression is different from the two other ones that we have in the capitalist world? Yeah, well, I, I, I would argue that um, what... Um... To understand the capitalist system, mode of production is a system obviously for making money. It's a, a system of production for profit by the owners of the means of production. All the machinery, factories, offices, businesses are owned by a small number of people. 99% of us work for these owners around the world. We only can sell our labor. This is the nature of the capitalist mode of production. So. Uh, the, the driving force to produce things that people need comes from whether profits can be made by the owners of capital. Now, Marx showed 
that this process of capitalist production does not proceed in a harmonious way. It does not proceed in a steady rise of improvement of conditions and living standards for everybody. It goes in a series of crises, of bumps, of slumps, every eight to 10 years, as you say, on average, since capitalism became the dominant mode of production in the world, probably over the last 200 years onwards. It has become the dominant mode of production. There's no place in the world now, really, where capitalism does not dominate in the process. A very small number of areas, perhaps in the middle of the Amazon forest, there are a few areas where capitalism still doesn't dominate, but even that I doubt. So this has become the dominant mode, and it, what it produces is a series of booms and slumps on a regular basis. Capitalism goes forward for a few years, then the profits of the capitalists begin tend to decline, they get into a crisis, they stop investing, they stop employing their workers, and we go into what we call a slump of overproduction. Too much is being produced that people can't buy, the capitalists can't, are producing too much to make a profit out of it. Uh, this, pro this mechanism, which, by the way, mainstream economics just cannot explain or understand, uh, takes place on these sort of regular place uh, periods of time. But what I argue in my book, The Long Depression in particular, was that we can see that there are waves, upward waves of profitability, which last for quite a longer time. And with, so that there is the slumps of eight to 10 years are, are relatively weaker in these up periods of profitability. And then there are quite long periods of downward uh, movement in profitability when the slumps are much more severe. And so you can, beyond the eight to 10 years, you can begin to see sort of longer waves of profitability up and down. And these tend to be, in the most advanced countries, around about uh, 16 to 20 years up, 16 to 20 years down. And if you take the whole cycle of up and down, it's something like, uh, and the, Rus uh, the Russian economist Kondratiev noted this in the early 20th century, something like 50 to 60 years cycle from one going up and then coming down again, 50 to 60 years. There's a whole longer cycle there which is driven by innovation, technology, and other commodity factors, which uh, we can deal with. But that means at the end of that, the longer period of uh, the 60 years, so getting towards the end of it, when the slump comes, it tends to be much more severe and long lasting. And in fact, we could begin to say that it's not like the other slumps of the eight to 10 years that we've seen. So after I give an example to our viewers, if we take the period since the Second World War to now. There have been slumps in uh, the capitalist economies, the major economies, every eight to 10 years from 1946. And you can look, the, look them up, they're all in a line. And perhaps the most recent ones we can think of are 1974 5, 1980 82, 1990, 2001, and of course, what we call the Great Recession of 2007 8, and now the COVID slump of uh, 2020. 20. So they're about eight to 10 years. But what we notice is that in the second half of that period, from about 1980 onwards, growth and uh, development of the economy by capitalism is weaker and weaker. And it, it, we, I, I would argue that from the period of the Great Recession in particular to now, we've entered a period where growth is really low. Economic growth real GDP or growth domestic project, and the national output of an economy is growing in nearly all economies much slower than it did in the 60s uh, or the 70s and even the 90s. It's growing at, in the advanced capitalist economies only about 2% a year. That's very low. And even in the so-called emerging economies like Brazil uh, or others, it's been growing maybe at 3 or 4%. But not even that sometimes now in the period. So this, this is a depressed period for capitalism. Capitalism is not expanding fast. It's not investing fast. Its profitability is low. Its ability to employ people and raise their living standards uh, is limited. So it's a depressed period. Now, in the book, I argue long depression. I argue that there are three, only been two other periods like that, which you pointed out, was in the late 19th century from the 1870s to the 1890s, depending on the country. And of course, in the great, uh, what was called the Great Depression from 1929, particularly in the US up into the Second World War, but also in Europe as well. And it's a similar period to that. At the end of this long cycle, 60, 70 years, we're in this depressed period. And that can go on 
it doesn't come out quickly. It can go on for 10, 15, 20 years. And so if you, it, the whole of the two decades that we've been through in the 21st century can be described as two you depressions. You have booms and slumps inside the depression. You have booms and slumps inside them, correct, yes. And so the booms and slumps of eight to 10 years remain. But what we notice is that in, uh, the, when you come out of the slump, you don't get a great big leap forward for many years. It's very feeble. So, for example, after the 2007-8 Great Recession, uh, the growth rate has been in the advanced countries less than 2%. And in the emerging economies have also not done very well either, compared to the period even from the uh, 1990 up until the Great Recession, where there was a higher growth rate. And if you go back to the 1960s, which uh, even mainstream economists call the golden age, from about 1948, say, to 1964, when growth rates were in, in the emerging economies, six, seven, eight percent a year, uh, Argentina and so on, all those other countries growing quite fast, and the, and the cap capitalist advanced countries are growing at four or five percent a year, two or three times faster than they're uh, growing now. That was a golden age. Actually, it was a, it's an exceptional period. Many um, mainstream economists or Keynesian economists hark back to the days of the golden age and say that's you know that's what we've got to return to all we need is get the governments together to to return to this period but that is an exceptional period it's, it's really never going to happen again in my view uh, unless and the only way it could happen again is if workers are so crushed by this current depression in a slump that it creates the conditions for capitalists to in dramatically increase their profitability and exploit workers more effectively. But I would argue that it's increasingly difficult for capitalism to expand faster anymore. They're running out of cheap labor around the world. Everybody is being exploited to the full. Um, they are not finding the ability to find new avenues for investment that can take uh, uh, the capitalist economy forward. So even, uh, so it's, it's more and more difficult to get out of this depression. Uh, this the slow crawling pace of economic growth and expansion of living standards. So working people around the world cannot expect a golden age. It's not going to come again. And that uh, the only way it's going to come is either by getting rid of the system and introducing a one that's based on the control of the working class democratically, or by capitalism imposing the most uh, vicious repression uh, in a severe slump. Uh, to create the conditions for them to expand on the on the rest of us. Okay, thank you. Um, let, uh, let's talk a bit about the the law of the tendency of um, of the rate to profit to fall, right? Mm. Because I know that you take this uh, problem uh, very seriously, and uh, Marx explains that the the most important internal law of the development of capital and the basis of its limits, uh, uh, he explained it saying, I quote Marx, capital itself is the contradiction in process due to the fact that it tends to reduce working time to a minimum, while on the other hand puts working time as the only measure and source of, health, of wealth. Uh, this contradiction is the basis of the law of the tendency of the rate to, of profit to fall, right? And I know that you see this problem of uh, the fall of the rate of profit as the most important explanation for the crisis of capitalism. But I know also that there are different explanations among the Marxists, economists, on the nature of the crisis under capitalism. For example, you and David Harvey that diverge about it, right? Yeah. So ca can you explain uh, your vision uh, and uh, the difference uh, with Harvey, for example, that is well known here in Brazil? Yeah. Uh, first, let me say, Luciana, uh, viewers should note that uh, the mainstream economists around the world in the institutions and in the universities do not consider there is a problem. Yes, there are things wrong with capitalism. It's either by chance that things go wrong, or bad policy, or criminality, 
but actually the capitalist system work can work effectively and harmoniously, and it doesn't have an inherent contradiction that makes it impossible to grow. That's absolutely vital for them to argue, otherwise uh, <laughs> they are not going to be able to defend uh, the current mode of production. And that's, let's get, be clear, that's 95% of anybody who thinks about economics is, what, is that view. And even amongst uh, the left of, uh, or the heterodox, the academic economists like to call uh, those people who don't agree with the mainstream heterodox economists. And these people aren't necessarily Marxists, they are really supporters of some form of Keynes. And they say, yes, there are things, actually there are things wrong with capitalism. We do need to put them right. It's not a perfect system and it requires uh, policies by government to reckon to compensate for the failures of capitalism. But when we get to a Marxist view, the Marxist view stands from the point of view, which as you correctly pointed out, is based in my view on, the, on Marx's law of value. And what is Marx's law of value? Marx's law of value says this, that um, capitalists own the means of production, they employ workers, they only produce to make a profit. So com all the commodities and uh, things that we need and services that we require only appear, uh, we need them, and they will be produced because we need them, but only if capitalists can make a profit out of it. So there is an immediate contradiction between the social needs of people and the private profit of the owners of capital. Now, why is there a contradiction? The contradiction not, is not just because of that, it's because the profitability of capital cannot be sustained indefinitely unless they can squeeze more and more value out of the exploitation of workers. Uh, as Marx said, there's no value. What do we mean by value? We mean, the, uh, we mean that the things, the resources, the things that people need, if you like, uh, there is no value produced unless workers go to work. We're not in a society where robots make robots, make robots, make robots, and the rest of us do nothing. Human beings do nothing. Human labor has to be, uh, go to work, has to do things in order to produce things. So capitalists cannot get profits unless they put workers to work, and they can only get profits if they can take more of the value that the workers have produced in money, if you like, than they pay the workers in wages. And that is the nature of the system. But workers are necessary to produce value. And if you, what happens under capitalism is the capitalists are competing against each other to get more profit. Now, how do you get more profit? How does the capitalist get more profit? Well, he can get more profit by getting more workers in to produce more value. But of course, that means he's got to pay more workers and more wages. So that's a cost involved in that. Or he can get workers to work harder or longer. So not just four hours a day, not just eight hours a day, 10 hours a day, no weekends. That used to be the case, but workers have fought against that and reduced the hours of work in a week and in weekends for generally free of work, but not for everybody even now. But uh, that, that restricts their ability to lengthen the working day. They can make workers work harder by making the intensity of work, checking them as they come in, making sure they don't go up for a break, keeping them on working flat out to intensify work. That increases the amount of value in the existing time available. But the biggest way capitalists can get more value out of workers is to give them, get a machine which can uh, dramatically increase the amount of units of commodities that are available uh, to sell on the market. So if you've got a machine that does what 10 workers can do, and it can produce 100 times more than that 10 workers, then you've got a lot more product you can sell on the market. And also the unit cost of that is falling. So you can, you can outbid the other capitalists in the market because you've got the most efficient plant. But that means you start to reduce the number of workers you use. So you may still employ the same number, but you're spending much more money on the machines and the factories and the computers and the software to, to increase that productivity. So the relative uh, position between the investment you're making in what Marx called the machinery and raw materials, you call it constant capital because it doesn't make any value itself, but it's necessary, it's relative to how much they spend on the workers is key because it means that if profit only comes from workers working to produce value, so value only comes from workers, then relatively the amount of value increasing 
will tend to fall relatively to the investment that the capital is making. I'll, I'll explain that again to, to, to viewers because it's important. When capitalists invest in machines, raw materials, and labor, they produce more value, okay? They expand their production. But if they're investing more in machines than they are to labor, then in value terms, the amount of value that's increased, the total value goes up, but not as much compared to the amount that they've had to make an investment in. So that the rate of profit or the rate of value increase starts to decline, it tends to decline. Capitalists can overcome that. They can make workers work harder. They can uh, uh, increase, uh, invest abroad. They can, where it's cheaper, they get cheaper labor. They can do lots of things to try and uh, resist this tendency for profitability to fall over time. So Marx explains in Capital and other places, this tendency, and he says this is the most important law of political economy, because what does it tell you? It tells you that capitalism has an end. It cannot go on forever because it has an inherent contradiction, and that contradiction is expressed in the tendency of the falling rate of profit. So it's a key law uh, from the law of value to the law of profitability is linked together in Marx's analysis of why there are problems in capitalism, the crises, and also why Capitalism cannot last forever as a, human, as a system of social organization uh, by humanity. It's transient in that sense, just like feudalism was before and other systems. This is the economic reason for the, the inability of capitalism to go on forever. Of course, it can stagger on forever if we don't do anything about it, but that, that is the contradiction which exists. Now, having said all that, Luciana, uh, that is a view which I think is Marx's view about the nature of crises uh, in capitalism and the cause. And you bring a lot of empirical evidence of this in your blog. I do. I try to not we don't just describe it as I've just done to now. I hopefully describe it better when I write it. But um, try to provide. It does the rate of profit fall? That's. A, I mean, this is a straightforward empirical question. And um, by the way, this has been denied for decades by. Uh, not only people who are against Marxists, but other Marxists say, well, the rate of growth, you know, it's irrelevant. It doesn't fall. It's nothing to do with it. But the evidence is staggeringly strong. And every year it gets better as more uh, scholars develop the evidence. Even this year, we've had a pile of new evidence which justifies the, the story that if you take, go back to, if you like, closer to the beginnings of modern industrial capitalism, say the early say, 1850s, uh, and right up to now, that's 170 years since Marx wrote Capital in the volume one in 1867, we can show conclusively that over time, the rate of profit in the major economies in capital has fallen uh, to, the, to a low, very low level now uh, in the early 2020s, not in a straight line. And it's important to know why it goes up and down. There are lots of reasons that's key to understand because if there's a rise in profitability for 20 or 30 years, that can make a big difference to what's going on in our labor movement and what's going on in the world economy uh, because it, will, it changes the picture in many ways, which obviously is a, a political issue that we can discuss. But, it, but the overall tendency is confirmed in the actual figures. Now, having said that, okay, so the rate of profit does fall and it was in Marx's capital. But it's not the reason for crises. That doesn't prove it's the reason for crises. And there, most, I, if I was to, um, if we got all the Marxist economists of the world onto this uh, session right now, and of course that would mean there are about three of us. No, I, I, I underestimate. Uh, there are so few Marxist economists. Uh, remember the joke that Lenin made that the that we could get all, in 1915, we could get all the revolutionaries in one stage coach. Well, the argument is the same for Marxist economists. There's not many of us, uh, but those, if we got them all here, I could probably tell you, at least certainly 20 years ago, that 95% of them would disagree with what I've just said, that they would say that the rate of profit is not relevant to crises. The alternative theories offered, which they also can find in Marxist capital, they look for them, is that, uh, think of it simply this way, and I think many workers are attracted to this idea. The workers produce something, they get a wage, but the capitalists get much more money from selling the goods, so the workers cannot buy back all the goods that they produce. 
Now, that's absolutely true. Workers cannot buy back all the goods that the capitalists have sold on the market because they don't have their wages are less than the total amount that's been produced in money terms and sold on the market. Otherwise, the capitalists would make a profit. So the argument is presented is that crises are caused by workers not having enough money to buy the goods. So there's underconsumption. They can't uh, they can't consume uh, all the goods that the capitalists have got, and that what causes a crisis. But if you think about that theory, that means that capitalism is impossible because all the time workers never have enough money to buy all the goods that the capitalists are selling on the market, and then. There's, then you begin to think, well, what do you mean the capitalists are selling on the market? There's lots of goods that the capitalists sell on the market that workers wouldn't want to buy. They don't buy factories. They don't buy widgets. They don't buy tanks. Uh, they buy goods that we need to consume on a regular basis on, on, in the household and so on. They don't buy these other things. Who's buying these other things so that capitalism works? Other capitalists are buying those things. And that's the missing uh, factor in this theory Capitalism is not caused, has crises because of underconsumption. There's always underconsumption in that sense of workers. It's caused because capitalists find that whatever they're selling to, other capitalists or to workers, they're not making sufficient profit to continue uh, the process, which is the law of the tendency of major profit. So the underconsumption theory doesn't work. Now, there are a couple of other theories that Marxists present. They say, well, the capitalism's anarchic. It's not planned, it's all over the place. So there's lots of disproportions and anarchic decisions being made and making mistakes, if you like. Capitalists are investing in things where there aren't any money or, and so on. So it's because they're competing and it's, it's not planned. Well, there's a certain element of truth in that. It is chaotic in that sense. But, it's all, but underneath the chaos are laws operating, laws of value and profitability, which drive capitalism in certain directions. So the anarchic argument isn't sufficient to explain why there are crises every eight to 10 years. Why are there crises every eight to 10 years and recurring all the time? Again, if it's anarchic, then capitalism doesn't work anyway. Uh, uh, it, that can't be an explanation. The other ones are, there's a spe capitalist speculate and cause a crash, you know, financial speculation, the financial crises, um, that, that too much debt develops in the economy and then it collapses. All those are relevant to crises, but are they the key causes of crises that are going on on a regular and recurring basis? So that is where uh, I think that the best explanation of crises from Marxist point of view lies with the law of the tendency of rate to profit to fall. Now, as I say, lots of other Marxists, probably the majority still do not agree with that. You mentioned uh, Professor David Harvey, um, uh, he's very world famous as uh, a Marxist scholar. He has a fantastic website where he goes through every chapter of Capital so that you can follow every chapter of Capital and, and, and be, get his lectures and so on. And he has argued over the years, although not always, back in the 60s, he had a much closer position to what I've just said, but he has changed his view over the last 30 or 40 years to the view that actually it's not the rate of profit that matters. What matters is um, these, these uh, there, it, there could be a crisis in the consumer sector. There could be a crisis because the government's up the creek. Uh, could be a crisis financially. He has a diagram which shows various hotspots, he says. And the main one, he says, the capitalism's changed. It's no longer a, an industrial capitalist economy. It's a more, more a consumer economy, a financial economy, and that's where the crises and the battles go on. He says that's where the class struggle goes on too. The class struggle is no longer in the factory, in the workplace, so much. When I say to him, you're going, he said, I don't mean it's not there, he, said, he says to me when he debates with me, but it's elsewhere. It's in, in the consumer boycott, it's in the financial sector, it's in rent battles and so on, uh, against um, how, landlords and so on. It's less amongst workers in the factories and the workplace, because that's where the cause of crisis is more is shifted. I don't agree with this particular analysis. Also, I think it, it what it means, it, the danger of it, apart from the fact that it's empirically wrong, in my view, that's the most important thing. It's not a question of, I don't, don't like it, <laughs> so I don't agree with it. No, I don't think it's empirically correct. And But also, if it's, it's the danger of it is it actually takes the class struggle away from the battle between the control 
of value and surplus value between the workers and the capitalists in the workplace. I'm not talking about industrial factories, although obviously they still exist, but in every workplace, the service sector everywhere, the key class struggle surely is between workers and their conditions and the profits that the people they're working for are. That remains the key uh, kernel of class struggle and also remains the key problem for capitalism. Uh, I don't think they have a problem with consumers boycotting their products or with, they have a problem with the financial irregularities, but if they're making lots of profits, they can handle financial irregularities as well. The key battle is between labor and capital in the workplace, whatever it takes, and how the profits are being distributed in the exploitation process. That remains, in my view, the, 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 the key battle. And therefore, the profitability for capitalism is the key health indicator. If you want an indicator of the health of a capitalist of the capitalist economy, what's the state of their profitability? What's the rate of profit in that country or in this country or internationally? And how do you see the strength of the the strength of the working class to to fight this battle for the the, the value and the share yeah. of the the wealth? Well, it, it varies, Luciana, as we know. I mean, first of all, let's say the class struggle never ends. Now, uh, the class struggle goes on every day in every workplace at varying degree. This is the and has it. Does the class struggle generalize into a mass movement in a country or internationally? Not very often. I mean, if we want to viewers think about it, how many revolutions have there been in the last 200 years, particularly workers' revolutions? How many have there been? Very, very few. But the, the thing about that is that when a re you do have a revolution, a workers' revolution, which is of major proportions, it transforms the world. That's but it doesn't happen very often. In fact, it's, it's, a, it's a very rare bird, isn't it? Hiding in the forest. Some, and, or to use Marx's phrase, it's like a mole uh, under the ground, which suddenly comes to the surface, but not very often. So the class struggle is always taking place in, a very, uh, in the workplace and elsewhere, in all sorts of areas, all the time. And the impact of capitalism, grotesque distortion of our lives is always there. But the impact of a mass movement isn't doesn't happen very often, uh, but it 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 does happen. That's the point. It can happen, and, and it has happened. And the opportunity is right. When will it happen? Well, if I could uh, tell that, um, you know, I, you could I could become uh, the god of the revolutionary movement. I you can't tell that. You uh, in, 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 but what you can tell it's a bit like um, I quite like uh, the, the analogy of climate change that we know that the, the world is getting warmer and warmer. Climate change is going to cause disaster. It's coming. We can't say exactly when. And sometimes the weather today is looking good and the next day it isn't. Uh, so uh, so it, the weather on a, on a yearly basis is no indication necessarily of what is happening underneath in, in a, the whole tendency of direction of climate change and global warming. And that's similar, I, I would argue, in terms of the class struggle and the workers' movement. But we must try to gauge it as best we can. So we must look at what's happening in the economy, in different countries, and in general, what, what's the reaction of the working class and the labor movement to this, and all the things which cut across their ability to unite. All the, we know this, and if we're engaged in activists in the movement, it's a difficult struggle. And I would say for the majority of our lives, possibly, there's not going to be many fantastic opportunities when it's going to be transformed, but it could happen. It did happen. I, I, I finished on this point. I, I, when I was as young as Luciano, which was in the 1960s and 1970s, 1960s, 1970s, 1970s, it was a revolutionary period. I mean, in, in Europe, uh, Portugal, Spain, Italy overthrew fascist and military governments and in Turkey and in Greece, all across Southern Europe. We had the Vietnam, uh, the American war in Vietnam, America defeated for the first time uh, in, a, in an imperialist war that they conducted on behalf of imperialism. Uh, that was a, a dramatic period. And also major industrial and class struggles in the advanced capitalist countries, because ca the capitalists have found after the period of prosperity and, and the golden age had come to an end, profitability was falling. 
they had it to, to lower the position of the, of the labor, reduce labor share in order to restore their profitability. So they reversed their policies of being uh, relatively reasonable, at least in the advanced countries, to a policy of vicious attacks of privatization, destruction of the trade unions, of deregulation of the economy and the labor markets and so on, in order and to shift the invest abroad to weaken the labor movement in the advanced countries and exploit the uh, global south more effectively. These were measures as a result of the falling profitability of capitalism. That produced a big movement by workers in the advanced countries and across the world from about 1968, the May events, right up until the early 1980s. It was a, that was my revolutionary period. That was my, uh, that was what drove me into, into activity in the revolutionary period. But after 1982, viewers will know, or it goes, we went into the 80s, the reactionary period, which is called in the academic circles, the neoliberal period, where the, the real policies of capitalism were restored, if you like, um, the workers' movements were defeated, both by two things defeated the workers' movements. First of all, massive slumps. You know, slumps are not good for workers' movements. If everybody's unemployed, then it's very difficult to struggle. The best periods for revolution, these are, in my view, from my experience, is after a period of 20 or 30 years of relatively good growth, relatively high employment, good wages, strong unions, then the capitalists attack you. That's when, that's when the workers are reasonably strong enough to fight back and possibly defeat. But if they're completely smashed, as in the 1930s and so on, it's very difficult to restore confidence and unity and build a movement when everybody is unemployed or got very low uh, wages. So depressions are not good periods for struggle. And so this current depression of a long depression has not been a good period for struggle. It's been a difficult period. Yes, there have been workers still struggle and we've trans occasionally transformed the situation in different countries, but it, it's not been easy. What we need is a period where workers have got some confidence, some power uh, to organize and, and develop. That period will come again in my view, but at the we can analyze the economic situation to see whether that's likely when it's likely to happen. The class struggle is always there, but it takes different degrees of intensity and only sometimes do we move to a revolutionary situation. Yeah. Right, uh, so let's talk about, you, you, you have already mentioned it, but I wanted to go deeper on this um, matter of the Keynesian policies and monetary, modern monetary theory, because you say, you say that uh, neoliberal policies were a way to counterbalance this tendency of the rate to, of profit to fall, right? Yeah. And also that the massive massive investments in the financial sector rather than in the productive sector yeah. is also due to the low profitability of the productive sector. Yeah. And uh, so I ask you about these Keynesian policies and the modern monetary theory that I don't know, in my view, is, is very similar to Keynesian policies. Uh, I mean, despite the fact that uh, these policies, they, they don't change the system, they are an attempt to fix capitalism, uh, to make it more human, as if it were possible to make it more human. Do you think that in this present stage of capitalism, in this financial stage, is it possible to go back to a Keynesian policies at any moment in any hmm. place of the world? Right. Well, there are two questions here, I think. Um, for those of viewers who don't know what modern monetary theory is, um, it, it's um, what modern monetary theory is, and it's a fairly new uh, fangled version that's come up over the last 20 years. Uh, both uh, the more radical Keynesian economists, those are, uh, what did Keynes say originally? Keynes said, capitalism's got problems, it gets into a slump, people don't get full employment, government has to intervene, spend some money, reduce interest rates and create the conditions where everybody can get a job again. So government should intervene. That's what Keynes argued in the 1930s. Because remember, the mainstream position in the 1930s of the economist was there's nothing you can do. Uh, if you have a slump, just wait till it gets over and then it will take off again. And, and, and if the reason for a slump, if there is a reason for these slumps, is because workers try to hold their wages up. They should let their wages collapse so that 
capitalists get their profits up and then we can grow again. Uh, that was what the mainstream view was. Now, Keynes said that's totally wrong. There's no guarantee that if work, work wages fell, that you would get full employment and the capitalists would invest again. So the government's got to intervene, even if it just uh, spends money to make people dig holes and fill them up again. At least there's spending put into the economy and we get things going. So if you like, Keynes was against what we now call austerity, holding down government spending, uh, and not reducing uh, interest rates, not creating the conditions for people to get full employment. So it, it was sounded quite a radical policy in the 1930s. Um, and uh, Keynes made it absolutely clear the reason he was arguing for this policy, not only because he thought it was right, but because he saw the danger that the alternative would be socialism. The one thing he didn't want was socialism. He thought socialism was a terrible idea and that uh, what we, we've got to deal with this problem that capitalism's got, which is causing unemployment. And this is my solution. Actually, his solution was never applied or never worked. Uh, only the World War did that by creating full employment. But, uh, so the, but the Keynesian view remains that after the Second World War, when profitability was high, capitalism was able to uh, employ a lot of workers. We had mostly full employment, uh, not entirely around the global south didn't, but in the advanced capitalist countries, that was the case. Uh, and it was argued that this was due to Keynesian policies of managing the economy with government spending and so on. In my view, that's not really true. It was because profitability was high and capitalists could allow workers to increase wages because they wanted to employ them and make more money. And they could even allow governments to have some control over uh, production in order to ensure good growth and good profits. But when that started to disappear, as we just argued before, in the 1970s, then capitalist economic policy changed completely and Keynesian policies were dropped and we were replaced by policies which argued for privatization, uh, control of the money supply, don't spend too much uh, government money and debt, uh, policies in that direction, which was to design to increase profits against wages and that neoliberal period. So the mainstream economics argument back before Keynes was restored after the 1980s up to now. But of course, there's still Keynes around. So if only we could go back to the 1950s and 60s with Keynes's policies, government spend money, then we can uh, solve the problems of unemployment and all the other issues. That's what we need to do. We need government spending uh, to do this. The mainstream economists say, no, if you do that, then profits will be hit. You can't have that because capitalism relies on profits. So there's a contradiction here. The Keynesians believe they can actually uh, in, improved conditions of working people by spending the government money and, and, and borrowing more debt if necessary. Uh, but the problem with that is this is my, pro my argument. The problem with that, that sounds great because it means the end of austerity. What are, the last 20 years, we've had what is called austerity. That's the line that debt, debt can be, must be controlled. Brazil's government debt must be reduced. Brazil shouldn't run a budget deficit. It needs to balance the books. And until it does that, it's, it's a mess. Uh, that's the mainstream austerity argument. The alternative arguments say, no, it doesn't, now it doesn't matter what the deficit is. It doesn't matter if debt rises because that spending will produce more growth and will have uh, more employment. My, that and the modern monetary theory is merely a version of that. It says that we don't have to raise more debt. All the government and the central banks of Brasilia have to do is print more rail. Just print more real. Uh, and as the government controls real, it, only they can print real. They own the issuance of the currency. They can print as much as they want and spend it on the Brazilian economy. And lo and behold, problems are resolved. Austerity is, is removed. It's a very attractive argument, isn't it? That um, we can say, well, we can get rid of austerity. We don't have to have any more of this liberal, liberal uh, privatization and austerity. Let's go back to Keynes, spend government money, and this time, don't worry about uh, issuing bonds, just print it. Uh, when I used the word print, I was attacked by modern monetary theorists who said, well, you don't print money anymore. Print. I, no, I said, no, I know that. Did you not know <laughs> the quotes around it? Uh, all I'm trying to say is that that's what you're really doing. You're creating money, or not, you're actually not actually really even creating money, you're creating more currency. And how does that appear? All of the the central bank does 
is that they put it into the banks. Of, so the, uh, the Central Bank of Brazil puts real into the banks. It just says, with a flip of a computer button, here's another billion. Uh, and then you can spend it. Or you give it to the government in the government accounts and they can spend it on whatever. Uh, so this printing of money will solve the issue of austerity and take economies forward. But the big flaw in that is who is making the decisions on the investment of employment, of, of uh, technology, of uh, trade? Uh, who's making these decisions and what are they making decisions on? Well, it's obviously uh, the, the capitalist companies in Brazil and other countries um, and the banks are making decisions on whether they want to invest or not. So if you give them another 50 billion real, uh, to spend, will they spend it on productive things that will produce more jobs for people, more uh, exports, more uh, production that can meet people's lives, or will they just speculate in the stock market, uh, increase the dividends for their shareholders, buy back their own uh, shares to boost the price? Will they do financial speculation on this? Well, the answer has been, every time there's been this expansion of extra money, was called quantitative easing for the last 10 years. Uh, for the viewers, that means that uh, instead of reducing interest rates to make things cheaper for capitalists to invest, uh, you give them a load of quantity of money. It's called quantitative easing. So then the capitalists can invest. Well, actually, the banks take the money and they speculate in the stock market. So the stock markets for the last 10 years have rocketed out of this site, but growth in, in economies like Brazil has stagnated. There hasn't been the productive result of this process would be good would be a good idea to to use this theory if you also control the means of production and the banks then it's okay and, right yes if, if uh, this is what's missing from the keynesian modern monetary theory thing they they I, I use this phrase they say if we just create more money we don't even have to touch the sides of the capitalist the mode of production it stays exactly as it is before so all the fossil fuel companies are there Amazon's there, or all the mineral resource companies are there. Nothing's changed. The private sector has not been altered. All we've done is we give them a load of money and we pray that they invest productively uh, to do that. But turn it around the other way and change the social structure of the economy so that we actually, governments and the public, working people control these companies uh, and plan, and then we can plan the economy using the resources of these companies. And yes, if we can produce productively, there's no reason why we shouldn't increase the amount, create more money or, or borrow more money. You can borrow if you produce more. You can't borrow if you don't produce more. Uh, and who is deciding who is going to produce more and what terms? That's the social issue, which is ignored by the Keynesians and the modern monetary theorists. Uh, so that, that is my fundamental critique of uh, not only MMT, to use it for shorthand, um, but also the Keynesian theory in general. Right. Uh, well, I'm going to bring you a set of questions sent by Roberto Robaina, who I have uh, introduced for you in the beginning of our chat. Uh, Roberto has been studying the capital and all Marx works for a long time, and he is the main terrorist and policymaker of our organization. And he is the one who introduced me to your blog, so I owe him <laughs> this. <laughs> well, I owe him much more things, but at least this debt I will pay. <laughs> uh, so I, 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 I will read the, the question yeah. for, uh, that he made for you. Uh, there are many theoretical debates about the perspectives of capitalism and the evaluation of its times of contraction and expansion. Kondratiev cycles, as Ernst, yeah. Ernst Mandel defended, periodic cycles of about uh, 100 years, as Giovanni Arrighi spoke, secular stagnation, as even a bourgeois economist like Larry Summers defined. So, uh, four questions related to this topic. Uh, comment on your own view of capitalism in perspective and from a theoretical point of view on the issues of cycles. Mm -hmm. uh, 
in the 80s, computers began to be massified as capitalist production. What is your assessment of this fact in terms of the growth of capitalism in the 90s and in the 2020s until now? Uh, about the artificial intelligence, what role it can play in a new expansion, if it can. And finally, what kind of prospects does the capitalist exploitation of, of Africa open up? All very good questions, Isiana. It's, uh, it, I'll see if I can um, remember. The first one is that um, I think Roberto is referring, which I've briefly discussed before, the idea yes, that beyond the, the booms and slumps of eight to 10 years, there are longer cycles, which we can yeah. probably identify in capitalism. And uh, as I said before, the Russian economist Kondratiev uh, was one of those who, who identified such a longer cycle. He based it on the commodities of production, commodities like um, yeah, basic commodities like uh, raw, raw materials and resources and so on. The movement up and down of prices. I, but, I I heard you say somewhere that you kind of agree with this uh, yeah, cycles, I think but you have yeah. you have been go you, you went further, let's say. Well, I would argue I, I go a bit further. I say that the Kondratiev cycle gives us the basis of that. I think there are two factors which I found I would argue that uh, first of all, with within the I think the Kondratiev cycle, which is this fifty to 60 year cycle, possibly longer now, it's been stretched out a bit more. It's driven not just by commodities, uh, raw material prices around the world, but it's more driven by innovation and the cluster of innovations and uh, new technology, which comes together at certain periods that has a burst of growth and then dies away and is replaced by a new cluster. And they seem to cluster together in certain periods. When, when uh, the situation is available where profitability is likely to to rise for a long period, then we can, a whole load of innovations that are being lying around, discovered by scientists, but nothing done about them, are suddenly taken up by capitalists and developed in order to, why they want to take them up? So they can increase the productivity of labor, uh, reduce the amount that they have to spend on labor and expand their production and get higher unit value from production by introducing a whole range of new technologies. And if the profitability cycle is upward, uh, then they're in the position to exploit uh, these new technologies. So I added to the idea of a longer cycle, these profit cycles, which are just the boom and slump things of eight to 10 years, but over a period of 25, 20, 25 years of an up cycle, and then the law of the Tennessee Road profit starts to operate and you go down again. So over a 50, 60 year period, you've got this up and down cycle of profitability, uh, sort of within, uh, the uh, Kondratiev cycle. I mean, this is a tentative idea. I think the long wave or long cycle theory has a lot uh, of evidence to, to support it. And it's also very interesting, but it tells you what sort of period you're in economically, or at least capitalism's in. Uh, in my view, we're in the bottom half of a downward pit of the profitability cycle. That's where you get that depression period after 60 years. If that comes to an end, then you could have a new wave of profitability. But that will be based on a new cluster of innovations, which we know are hiding away down there. And one that's just referred to by Roberto is the new developments in artificial intelligence and in robots. We already know robots are being applied across the world, but they're still fairly limited. They're growing fast. And artificial intelligence, which uh, viewers know, means basically that uh, human beings don't have to think uh, to make decisions, uh, computers and other will start thinking for themselves and make the decisions. And they're more than just computers making decisions from programs, they're actually making decisions themselves and developing their own intelligence, becoming artificially created. That's the argument or theory of artificial intelligence. You've got to this level of innovation where this uh, could take place. It still isn't really diffused. And when I say diffused, I mean, it's not spreading everywhere. Artificial intelligence doesn't really uh, operate across the, uh, the, the services and industry of the world yet. But I can give you a good financial example. I like this example. In my own uh, Dragon's Den uh, past, um, there's such a thing called a hedge fund. A hedge fund in financial world is where a bunch of very well-off people 
get other very well-off people to give them a load of money, and then they gamble with it in the market, in the financial markets, not in the horse races, but in the financial markets to get even more money. And they take, they take a management fee and a cut out of all this money they're uh, investing on the behalf of others. It's called a hedge fund because they don't just buy things on the hope that prices go up. They actually buy things on the hope that prices go down so that they're, they're going both ways to make a, a bet. Uh, now, these hedge funds have to make decisions about what they're going to invest in each day or each week or whatever. Uh, and they might sit around a, a small table like this, because they're often small companies, and make those decisions. Now, there's one hedge fund I know quite well, where I said, well, what are you, what are you going to do? They said, well, we've, we're just going to vote on whether we should uh, sell the real or not. Uh, so there's four of us going to vote, but the fifth vote will be decided by the robot. And the robot sits at the, at the desk, it's obviously a computer, and it gets the information and it makes a decision uh, and it makes a vote. So human beings can be replaced on making financial speculative decisions and maybe on other things as well all the time. This is the process that's building up. That's a possible development over the next period that robots will, and artificial intelligence machines will increasingly replace human beings in their operation. Now, for if you think of it in general, it's, in some ways, it's a great thing. It will mean it should be under a social society. It means a dramatic reduction in the toil and hours of labor that human beings have to engage in. Instead of working 40, 50 hours a week, we can work five, 10 hours a week because all the robots and the machines will be doing uh, this work for us uh, so that we can spend more of our time doing more creative things and the jobs that we need to meet our conditions, living conditions and the world's needs will be covered by machines. That's, it's a great technology, is a, would be a great process. But actually under capitalism, that's not what's going to happen. Uh, robots are replacing human beings and putting them on out of the job permanently uh, and replacing them all together as capitalism tries to employ more of these machines and, and shed uh, more labor. It's estimated that something like 40 to 50% of occupations that we're all working in now will disappear if robots take over in the next uh, generation. Does that mean that capitalism solved its problem? No, actually, it makes, if you think about the law of the tendency of the rate of profit to fall, that means yes, the situation will be worse for capitalism because they, we talked about the long ways of profitability. There could be this cluster of growth, but we then would have a very severe decline in the profitability of capitalism because there'd be less value being produced by the remaining labor force and only the labor force creates value. Now there's some economists that say, oh, well, that's, that shows that the value theory is wrong because there's much more being produced. So it's not true that uh, profitability is falling or is relevant because more things are being produced by the robots. Yes, but those more things that are being produced by the robots are not making profits for the capitalists who own those robots sufficiently. So they're coming into a crisis. Can we think of as a of a society with no human labor. Yes, you could, you could think of that, but before we'd ever get to that, there would be such a severe series of crises for capitalism because it's a, a mode of production for profit, before we ever get to that, that it would cause major crises. If, if we can con conclude on that, that robots and artificial intelligence will only become beneficial and pervasive in the world and beneficial under socialism. It's impossible under capitalism. We just create a major crisis ahead of us. And the dog agrees. Okay. Africa, and about <laughs> Africa. Yes, Africa. Well, uh, talking about before, the um, where is the global supplies of labor wow. in the world? Um, capitalism has been able to expand its tentacles out of the advanced countries of Europe, North America, and so on. North Asia and so on, into the global south around the world over the last uh, 100 years in a process of imperialism. Uh, and that has meant it sucked up cheap labor from around the world and increasingly that labor has disappeared. But perhaps the one area, because everywhere population growth is slowing down, uh, working age population is slowing down. Countries like Chile, uh, China, sorry, are no longer growing in working age population. India is still growing, but slowing. Everybody's slowing except uh, Africa. 
Africa is a completely still, in my view, a huge area for exploitation by an imperialism. Hasn't been touched yet. Take a country like Nigeria, which is 350 million people. It has a very high population growth rate. It will be, by 2050, 750 million people. It's dramatically increasing. 95% uh, of Nigerians are on the poverty level. It's an indication of a massive pool of labor available to capitalism to exploit. At the moment, it's just exploited by oil and gas companies and corrupt government in Nigeria, but other African countries are similar. So Africa remains a new area, still a, a my view, unde fully undeveloped area for capitalism to exploit. So it gives an opportunity for capitalism to have a new era of expansion, perhaps based on Africa, uh, but also means that African population will become a major force in the class struggle over the next uh, few decades as a result. Africa is suffering also the most from climate change, global warming, COVID, uh, all of the ills of capitalist society hit Africa the most. It's going to be a key uh, area uh, in the class struggle over the next generation. Well, um, let's talk about uh, USA. Uh, I read uh, an article in your blog uh, where you said that the monetary explosion and the fiscal stimulus being applied by the US authorities to revive the US economy after the pandemic slump is not going to do the trick. After the sudden rush of Bidenomics, the profitability of U.S. capital will resume its decline and investment and production will be weak. Can you tell us why do you have this uh, evaluation? Okay, well, everybody viewers know that the United States is the most important capitalist economy in the world. What happens in the United States is absolutely vital for us to understand because it is the leading imperialist power. It's the most largest military power in the world, bigger than all the others put together. It's the major financial center, even though its relative strength has declined to other capitalist economies over the last 40 or 50 years, it is still by far the most important capitalist economy. So what happens in the United States is crucial for us to understand what is going to happen to the world economy. That's particularly the case for South America, where the United States regards South America as its backyard. Uh, that, that it would uh, employ its policies in. So uh, the United States suffered a severe uh, slump in the Great Recession of 2008-9, brought on by the financial collapse of the banks, which in my view was the result of uh, difficulties in the productive sectors of the economy and the profitability of, that, of those productive sectors. After the end of the Great Recession, uh, capitalism uh, in America got out of uh, uh, that slump by keeping the banks going, it bailed them out at huge cost uh, to the uh, public purse, to the taxpayers and, and the rest of us in order to keep the banks going. But it didn't create the conditions for fast growth because profitability remained low. So we have, during the last uh, second decade of the 21st century, we've had, as I said before, very poor growth. And that includes the United States. The United States has grown better than the other six capitalist economies in that period, but only at 2% a year. Uh, all the others, UK, Italy, Japan, France, worse on the whole, or not much better, uh, but very low growth rate compared to previous periods for the United States. So uh, when COVID hit again, the, the world capitalist economy was actually going into recession again in 2019, just before COVID. COVID slump was so dramatic, as we know, it was really sharp. Uh, so the capitalist, in America had to do something. So they plowed loads more money into the financial sector, the stock market boomed. And also they, they, the government started to spend money, they had big fiscal spending to try and keep businesses going, to keep workers from uh, starving. Uh, so they, they, a lot of money was gone into that. But so that once the COVID uh, restrictions started to come to an end and people went back to work and companies opened up again, service industries and so on, trade began to open up again. You've got a big, what I call a sugar rush. If you think about it, in, in Brazil, you get some sugar cane and suck it hard, you're bouncing all over the place for a little while, at least the children are anyway. Uh, 
but it soon comes to an end. In fact, it leaves a nasty hangover sometimes if you have that sugar rush. Uh, so uh, in my view, as we came to the end of 2021, it's becoming clear that this burst of recovery is over. And US capitalism is going back into where it was in 2019. It's slowing down towards two or three percent. In fact, the forecast for the rest of the decade is 1.8 percent a year, which was worse than the previous decade. That's the official forecast by the American budget office. So uh, they're not, they haven't solved their issues. COVID is not creating conditions. Um, some people have argued in America that it's going to be like the 1920s, roaring 20s. At the end of the Second World War and after the Spanish flu epidemic, America had a bit of a burst of growth between 19. 22 and 29 ended in a, in a capitalist collapse, in the financial collapse, but you had a decade of fa relatively fast growth in the United States. I don't think we're going to have another roaring 2020s. It doesn't look like it. Then the profitability is way low. Uh, investment is low. Um, there's a huge amount of waste of unproductive investment in the financial sector. It's not going into the productive sector. So, so my yeah, so the, the COVID uh, slump is not uh, so bad as to uh, to to make a boom comes. To come that's out. what I. That's a good point. Now I don't think it is. I think just like after the Great Recession of two thousand eight nine, although it was a deep re recession, it hasn't created the conditions for a new boom. Which is why that's why I call it a depression period. It, it's like in the late nineteenth century, which is a better uh, analogy. From 1873 to 1890, there were there was periods of boom. From 18, there was a slump, really bad slump in 1873. Then you had about four or five years of growth. Then you had another slump. Then you had three or four more years. Then you had another slump. Uh, different countries at different degrees. So what you got was a very poor growth rate throughout the whole those 20 years, interspersed with little booms and and slumps. That's the sort of thing we're happening since in the 21st century of these, of these two decades. We had a mild slump in 2001. We had a very deep slump in 2008-9. Then we've had a severe but short slump with COVID in a year. Uh, and they're coming out of it. But I don't see that we're entering a new period of growth for capitalism or roaring 20s. Why do I say that? Because I look at the empirical level. The profitability is low, investment is low. Yes, people, quite a few, employment seems to be relatively good, although that's a bit of an illusion in the advanced countries, but it's in rubbish jobs. It's in part-time work, low-paid jobs, leisure centre, not in productive jobs, the training that's going to give people career and money and to go forward. Uh, and it's, it's often in the public sector in health and education where it has to be, and not in uh, new productive areas. So even though... It, so um, real wages in the advanced capitalist countries, real wages for the last two decades have hardly moved. So wages go up, but inflation consumes it. So the real wages view is, is the difference between the wages you get and how much the prices have gone up. And real wages have hardly moved on average uh, in the major economies. I don't know what it's like in Brazil. It's probably, I think it's worse in Brazil. You actually had a fall in real wages probably in that period, at least up until our since the end of the commodity boom of 2014, 2010, 2014. In the last decade, that's certainly been the case. Maybe in the first decade, that's not true because of the different situation in countries like Brazil and so on. So uh, real wages have been bad. So there's no, there's no uh, category of growth that I can see which suggests that would change. Maybe at the end of this decade, we're gonna have a, if we're right, if there's a slump every eight to 10 years, <laughs> If you like a clock, if you want, but uh, that at the end of this decade, there should be another slump. There's going to be another slump. Now, maybe that's so severe that it will change the situation, because that's what happened in the late 19th century. In the end, those series of slumps did create the condition for a sort of recovery. It was an imperialist recovery. Capitalism spread abroad, imperialism, and, co and took colonial possessions and expanded that way in order to get out of that uh, slump. And that, of course, eventually led to an imperialist war in 1914. That's the other danger we have now. As capitalism tries to expand, it faces a very dangerous rival, the old imperialist powers, namely a rising economic power like China. And it suddenly realized that this, this power 
and to a less extent Russia and others threaten its hegemonic position in the world. And the United States has decided that they're not there to, the, the original policy was to engage with China, we'll invest in China, we'll persuade them to become more capitalist and we'll take them over, we'll get, get McDonald's uh, screens up on the, in the cities and we'll, we'll control China like many other countries in the world. But China didn't operate that way. They found instead that the Chinese have sucked up all their technology and are now taking their trade and their position. So it's the major 21st century struggle coming up as US imperialism tries to find a way out and it faces a severe rival. Now it's reversed its policy. Now, at all costs, it must crush, curb and control China. And that can only mean a major confrontation uh, over the next decade or so. Yeah, uh, so let's go uh, uh, deeper on China because uh, China's numbers are astonishing. The growth mm. of GDP, the growth of GDP per capita, the uh, life expectancy, productivity versus wages, reduction of poverty, position in human development index, uh, the numbers are Good. So is it going to continue like this uh, and uh, close the gap with the advanced countries? And uh, do you think these gains are sustainable? And what impact does China have in the overcoming of uh, global depression, if it does have any? Well, the, the, the um, story of China since um, the 1949 revolution, which threw out the landlords and capitalists in China and the foreign imperialists in a, after a, a massive war against Japan and then a civil war against the uh, government of, of the um, colonialist government that was in China and the warlords. And the Communist Party came to power and eventually expropriated the landlords and capitalists as such as they were in China and introduced a planned economy generally publicly owned planned economy, except uh, obviously there were still private sectors, particularly in the land, but that, that a plan based on only public ownership of the means of production, which is the first starter of the transition to socialism, the removal of the capitalists and the establishment of a state which is planned on a public ownership basis. That transform the economy over the next decades. I mean, it's a great example of what a planned economy, in my view, what a planned economy uh, through public ownership, not through the anarchic process of capitalist competition can achieve. And it's unprecedented. This is the, the largest country in the world in population, and yet it's taken nearly three quarters of its population out of what uh, the official World Bank and others say is poverty. India hasn't done that. India's gone nowhere in achieving that, but China has done that. It's transformed that position over decades. It's uh, the zigzags of its uh, leadership policy is something to discuss, but the, the gist of the underlying forces of the huge state sector and its planning and the development of industry on that basis. Yes, the big capitalist sector as well, which in my opinion is, uh, poses a real stress and contradiction with capital, for China in the future. But the state sector and its plan uh, has taken the China forward in an unprecedented level in terms of growth. I mean, double digit, 10% growth a year, for year after year after year until fairly recently. But, but this is the point, uh, China is still well behind the productivity levels or income levels per person to, compared to the G7 countries. It's more or less on the same level as Brazil now, nearly. And that's unbelievable considering where Brazil was in 1949 and where China was in 1949 and now. That's a transformation that's taken place, but it's still way, way behind the G7 countries. Can it close that gap? In my opinion, no. It cannot do it on its own. It's not possible, even for China, even a large country like that, to define to come up to the level of, of the imperialist countries in terms of product productivity, technology, and even living standards because of imperialism. Because imperialism will curb that ability for China to do it. It cannot be done in one country. In my view, if we're going to have 
a society which takes everybody forward, it has to be done internationally. No, not even the United States can achieve uh, good living standards for everybody in the United States, uh, reduce the hours of toil and turn us into a society which, where technology is for the benefit of people and not to dominate people. Even the United States can't do that on its own because it has to trade with the rest of the world, it has to invest with the rest of the world. And if the rest of the world remained imperialist and the universe was so, was, uh, had a revolution and the workers took power, then it would still be a major contradiction. Although you'd have to say, it's very simple. If the United States had a socialist revolution in the next few years, I think it wouldn't be long before the rest of the world had a socialist revolution. On the other hand, if China, if you think whether you consider it socialist or not, cannot turn the rest of the world around unless it took an internationalist view. China is in a much more difficult position. It's isolated, particularly isolated now. Uh, it has friends, it's huge, uh, and so it cannot be crushed, but whether it can go forward to transform the rest of the world, no. Firstly, because uh, te technologically, it's not gonna be able to do that. It's surrounded by imperialism. And also the political policies of the Chinese government are not internationalist. They are not looking to make an international revolution for the working class. They're only interested in uh, Chinese development and in particular the development of their own layer of people at the top. Um, so they're not internationalists. They're not struggling to make international socialism. They don't have the philosoph that philosophy anymore. Um, if, if, even if they did in 1949, they certainly don't now. So. And, and that's a big mistake, because unless they have that approach, they are going to have find it increasingly difficult to grow. They're not going to collapse. They're not going to go down. They can they can go forward, but not at the same pace, in my view, that we've seen in the last uh, 40 or 50 years. Right. Well, I know I'm exploiting too much <laughs> of you, <laughs> but... Uh, Almost finishing, I, I want yeah. to come a little bit to Brazil. The Bolsonaro government has led our country to a very dramatic situation from an economic and social point of view. We, we, had, uh, we have 635,000 people that died to, due to the to COVID and to okay. the geno genocide policy of the government. Uh, Only the Americans have done worse than that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. Uh, unemployment and poverty also rose dramatically, uh, but fortunately, everything indicates that Bolsonaro will be defeated in the, mm. in the elections now in October. Yeah. Although we know that the fight against the extreme right will not uh, end. Uh, we will have to uh, continue fighting as uh, all around the world, because the extreme right is 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 um, a political force that is established in the world. But here, uh, Lula must be the new president of Brazil and uh, mm -hmm. making a class collaboration government again, mm -hmm. which we have been calling, uh, have called it, and uh, we will call again when he starts it, a social liberal government. What, uh, what would you expect from an economic point of view uh, for a post-Bolsonaro Brazil? Yeah. Well, if we, if we remember the first Lula Cup, it was a, regarded as a relative success that it improved uh, working class conditions, it the transformation of the previous regimes and so on. But uh, if we look at it economically, in some way, Lula, and for that matter, uh, Chavez in Venezuela were lucky uh, that there was a period when commodity prices were dramatically rising. China was expanding, as I say, at 10% a year, it was sucking in uh, commodities from around the world, not just energy, but all the sorts of food commodities and resource commodities that Brazil produced. There was quite a lot of, of investment of enabling even manufacturing sector in Brazil to expand. It, uh, the, the position of the Lula government was it enabled them to begin to improve the conditions of some of the poorest uh, people in Brazil through the uh, uh, various uh, benefits and so on that, that the Lula government did. Same thing applies in Chavez. But what 
the Lula government didn't do, of course, was change the social structure of the Brazilian economy. So imperialism remained, the multinationals remained, and um, the, um, the big Brazilian companies were not touched. Uh, finance, the banks stayed as they are, nothing changed in the social structure. So therefore, uh, that was fine. If capitalism in Brazil was doing okay for a few years, uh, Lula could get the resources of that to, to redistribute some of that from profit towards uh, labor and the poor to some extent. And so that was a, it was a, a typical op opportunity for reform, if you like, or a, a redistribution of resources. But when capitalism in Brazil turned down again, with the end of the commodity prices boom in 2010 onwards, uh, and has continued on this basis until very recently, we have the, the situation changed dramatically. Suddenly government had no revenues and the capitalists uh, were not making the investments required to deliver growth and more, more revenues. And suddenly the capitalists are saying, look to Lula's successor, Dilma and so on, yeah, you cannot go on with these policies. You've got to have austerity. You've got to reverse it. Otherwise we'll get no foreign investment and we won't be able to invest and there'll be no profits. And they capitulated to this point of view, uh, in my view, the leadership of the Workers' Party capitulated to this point of view because they never had a perspective of actually taking over the economy uh, and doing a, uh, on the basis of what the workers needed with the plan of public ownership. That wasn't their perspective. Why wasn't that perspective? Well, there are lots of different reasons you can ask their motivations. I always think the motivation is, you think about it, that requires a revolution. It requires the working class seizing the organs of power and transforming the economy. That's a very frightening thing to do. Uh, if, you're, if you're a leader of a social democratic party, am I really going to do that? I mean, what the hell's going to happen? It could end up like the French Revolution. I don't know, you know, it's a frightening thought. I mean, you've got to admit that it, it's, it's, it's a big, big, tough thing to have to do. You really have to have confidence in the class and to organize uh, to do that and to be confident that you can sustain it because you could be on your own in the world. You know, like Cuba was and so on. It's, it's, it's a big, it's frightening to the leaders of the Workers' Party, even if they believe that was what they wanted vaguely. It's not something they would push for because it's too frightening. So they didn't want to do that. Let's take the easy way out. Let's ex find another solution. Let the workers pay for this crisis, not the capitalists. So, and so the result was they got hammered in the elections. The right came up. I mean, I can remember, you, you know better than me, the Bolsonaro at the beginning, well, he's never going to win an election. He's, you know, it's going to be some sort of reasonable, moderate, conservative politician that's going to win. And then Bolsonaro comes up from nowhere because of the shocking situation that existed in Brazil, the extremities of what was taking place. And he was able to win that. It's just like Trump in America in that sense, uh, coming in uh, uh, into office against all the odds. Nobody expected Trump to win. The bourgeois didn't think Trump would win in America. The bourgeois in Brazil did not think Bolsonaro would win. But when he did win, of course, they all lined up behind him because they needed him against the other side. And the Workers' Party was left with, I mean, we use it in the English phrase, with egg on their faces uh, uh, because of the way that they do So what's going to happen now? I don't think there's any period of breather for our next Lula government. We're not going to have five or six or seven years of high commodity prices, which are going to provide Lula with some resources in which he can try to improve the conditions and carry through some reforms. From the very beginning, it is going to be a battle between the bourgeois forces who want austerity and profitability of the, for the companies and pluralism, and behind Lula, the expectations of the electorate that something will be done. Although maybe the electorate isn't that confident really this time around. Uh, I don't know what we think, whether the poll is gonna be high. I, maybe the poll will be high just to defeat Bolsonaro, but I, I'm not sure that Working people are very confident that Lula's going to do much. They just feel that maybe Bolsonaro should go. Um, yeah. on that. And so I'd, it's a, it's not going to be like it was in 2004, I don't think. Uh, 2004 was when he was in first time, I think. Right? It's going to be yeah. different. 
And I think Lula actually seems to think that's the case. So the best thing to do is just suck up to all the uh, uh, other parties and the, the pro-capitalist parties and try to get some sort of agreement uh, so that uh, I appear reasonably moderate and uh, we can actually do some, I can do a little bit here and a little bit there, which uh, will keep us uh, without, a, we don't want a confrontation. We don't want a class war. Let's see if we can find something which works for Brazil, as you would see it in the nation. Have I got that right? What do you think? Yeah, that, that's perfect. And the, the danger I see is that uh, although there, there are not high expectations, you're right, that people want to defeat Bolsonaro much more than they are expecting that Lula will be a wonderful government. Yeah. But they expect uh, some sort of uh, better life. Huh? Yeah. And uh, the danger is that the frustration on, on not delivering uh, something better in, in the economical uh, yeah. matter will make the extreme right even stronger. Yeah. Because Bolsonaro came out of this, came out of, out of the frustration with uh, the workers' uh, party government. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, Luciana, it, it could, Lula could be lucky. It could be that um, uh, commodity prices boom again because um, we're, inflation is booming at the moment and commodity prices, energy and food and so on, are rocketing. I think that's temporary uh, in my view. But if you had a sustained rise in prices of commodities in energy, food and other things, resources, um, this would benefit the Brazilian capitalist economy. They would, they would, they would gain, so they could, that could, that could be another lucky scenario. I just raised that as a possibility. So that it gives a little bit of room for Lula to wiggle. Um, but I'm not sure that's really gonna happen this time. That's what happened in 2004 to 2010. But not, not this time, I don't think. So it's going to be a very difficult situation. Very difficult for the people that are unemployed, yeah, that are absolute, in yeah. poverty. Very, very difficult. I mean, as we know, I look at the data. Of course, I never look at you. You're on the floor, but I look at the, the inequality of Brazil is just incredibly large. I mean, yeah. not just in income, but also in wealth. There's only one country in the world that has higher inequality ratios than Brazil, and that's South Africa. Yeah, it's terrible. Um, well, let's uh, finish our interview with some, some optimism. I, I heard you say in an interview that you think that the socialist propaganda is going to be easier after the pandemic. Uh, can you talk about it? Well, I, um, I think one of, the thing, one of the key lessons of the pandemic has been the complete failure of health systems in the capitalist economies around the world, either to prepare for the pandemic and then to handle it. And the reason health systems on the whole have failed is either they're just private health systems which are totally inadequate, which is the case in a lot of parts of South America and the United States, or even if they're public health systems on the whole, they have been so destroyed and decimated by austerity and neoliberal policies for the last 20 or 30 years, hospital beds reduced, doctors reduced, spending on hollowed out and privatized, all kinds of things going on in the G7 countries about the health systems. The great welfare state of, of Europe has been uh, completely ripped apart, particularly in the health system, because it's so expensive for capitalism. Health system, people get older, it's a very expensive system and they get ill. That's, we don't, why don't they just die? That's what the capitalists want. They don't want to have to look after these people. And they also don't want to educate these people unless it's just for the elite to do their jobs. This is money that's wasted as far as they're concerned. It's very short sighted. They are useless to capitalism. Yes, um, they might, so you might say, the Keynesians say that's very short sighted, you know, that they should let these things get human capital up as it's called. But actually capitalists on the whole don't agree. They, they want the profits over the next five years. They don't want to look about 30 years ahead. And so, so these things are being crushed and reduced as much as possible. So the, they couldn't cope with the pandemic. Health systems were just, um, so we are forced into huge lockdowns and all kinds of other restrictions, which if we'd had a proper health system and well preparation, we probably could have avoided most of it. But 
And, and anyway, the lockdowns only work because people, ordinary people, realised they needed to, <laughs> to isolate and protect themselves. And they, there was so, solidarity in doing that, on the whole, not entirely, but on the whole. And, uh, but what that demonstrated, I think, to a lot of people is that public sector, public services are vital. They, they can see that they're very, very important. So I think the campaign to improve public services and restore public services as public services is a powerful weapon as we come out of the COVID. The other thing is, it appears that because so many people have got sick and can't go back to work uh, because of, of long COVID and isolation and all the rest of it, and because there's there's a whole layer of industries that can't get enough workers, and they're being particularly transport, logistics, and things of this sort. This is forcing uh, uh, companies to pay more money to workers, and workers in those sectors are have a certain strength now, and they're trying to uh, improve their conditions and force up wages and so on. Uh, maybe this won't last, but I see both the on a political level. Um, the campaign for decent public services is a big political issue. And also on the industrial level, sectors of workers who have now become much more important to capitalism than they thought, and they have to try and meet their conditions. This is going to create the conditions for perhaps new industries or new sectors of workers uh, unionizing and going forward. We've seen very small measures of this in America and elsewhere, I've talked about Brazil, but um, these areas will, uh, I think, give opportunities for us to expect that they move to strengthen in certain areas. But I have to say, Luciana, we're still in an impressed world economy. It's not good conditions for the expansion of uh, workers' uh, strength and confidence around the world. But um, and another best indicator is how many struggles are defensive just to preserve what they had before. And how many struggles are offensive to improve on what you've got now? It's a good balance. I don't know. I still think the defensive are stronger. And that's, yeah, that's a sign sure. we haven't changed. Things haven't changed yet much. For sure. Well, I hope you don't regret having this interview with us. I, I, no. I exploited you for almost two hours. <laughs> that's all right, Luciana. My, my wife says, don't worry, I know what's happened. It, once you get going, you won't shut up, will you? <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I, I heard many of your uh, interviews in the YouTube and I saw that you like to speak. So I was confident that you would like to talk to us. <laughs> well, next time you can tell me to shut up and it's only, you know, let other people speak. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michael. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Michael. Bye -bye Thank you. Thank you, Michael. It was a great, great, great pleasure talking <laughs> to you. Thank you.